right, as we make our way in, let's uh, grab a hymnal and we'll start with a couple of songs this morning. Good to see everybody. Welcome to Northwoods Baptist. Let's all stand. Turn to number 259. Song number 259, Jesus Saves, Jesus Saves. to start off with this morning a great truth jesus saves number 257 just a couple pages back look and live that's really all it takes is just a look of faith and the heart to believe it look and live 257 <clears throat> i have a message from the lord
seated. Look and live. Hallelujah. You know, I've heard before, I don't know that this is verifiably true, but I've heard that there's, there's only a couple of words that are the same pretty much in every language, and one of those words is hallelujah. And it means praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord. Amen. All right. Well, glad to have you here this morning. Last, uh, last Sunday, we took up our Faith Promise Missions Commitment Offering. And, uh, and uh, if you have a card that you need to put in still, feel free to do that. But uh, as, as we stand right now, we have increased by uh, about $5,000 over last year's commitment. And so we went from 13000 towards missions to now we've promised 18000 in the coming year. And so glory to God. That's a big blessing. Somebody ought to be excited about that. This <laughs> morning. So uh, I know you're processing that. Like, how much is that really? for for church our size? That's a great increase, and I'm I'm just very very thankful uh, to you for you being uh, faithful to the Lord and obedient to that. Now uh, now that we've committed it, let's go ahead and give it. Right, <laughs> we're gonna do that too, and uh, it's easy to write something down. But uh, let's stick with it for sure. We've got a uh, business meeting next Sunday. We'll probably talk about missions some more then. But that'll be, uh, instead of tacking it on to the end of the service or anything like that, we're going to do it before the evening service. So 5 o'clock, if you want to come to that, uh, it's, it's open to anybody. And if you give regularly and you, you come, you probably want to be a part of it. Obviously, any votes are going to be, you know, for members only. But uh, you're free to come to that. Ladies Tea is this Saturday. Uh, 10 at 10 a.m. So ladies tea come on out for that and I'm sure that you know I don't know I was gonna say I'm sure there'll be food involved there will probably be dainty finger foods or snacks involved you know if there were men there'd be food involved I guarantee you so but uh, get with uh, get with Mrs. Hoyseth on that and uh, figure it out all right with that let's uh, ask the Lord to bless and we'll uh, take up our offering this morning so glad to have you each each here today this morning but let's pray father thank you so much for your goodness to us we love you and uh, lord the just the increase that we're able to see this year over last year in, in missions commitment lord that's that's very telling of of where uh, the hearts of your people are and that we are becoming more and more uh, missions minded and desiring to to lay up treasures in heaven to invest in things of eternity to try to really show what we believe in action. So Lord, we thank you for that, and we ask that you would bless the offering here that we're about to take up, and uh, Lord, bless each one who gives. In Jesus' name, amen. wanted to say also thank you for praying for uh, those of us who are down in Nebraska at the end of the week for the uh, men's retreat went very well thankful for uh, smooth travel safe travels and uh, the preaching was just uh, just right right what we needed as well and thankful for uh, the Lord speaking to our hearts and always good always a good time of fellowship there as well and it's it's something neat to see men from all 
all kinds of different churches coming together because you know the you get out there in the world and you're going to work and most people just have no heart for the things of god some people are just to be honest just quite vile in their words and the things that they're thinking about and the things they're talking about and it the bible says it it vexes our righteous soul you know it's vexing to be out that and then you get together with a bunch of men and they're singing out to god and they're hearing preaching and they're on their knees before the lord it's good it's good. It's the way it ought to be. And so it makes me already excited about our men's advance next April and being able to host that again. And oh, it's going to be it's going to be good. So praise the Lord. Remain seated as you turn to number 248. <clears throat> now I belong to Jesus. Thankful for that as well. 248. Amen. All right, before we get into the message this morning, Raylan's going to come and sing.
And of course, that's precious because that's my little girl there. But what a song as well. Simple song, but uh, great, profound truth in that. And if there's anything we need to keep in mind in this crazy life, if there's any message that I could even preach to you this morning, it's this. Oh, how he loves you and me. That's really what we need to know. So thank you for the song, Ray Lynn. Thank the Lord. Matthew chapter 7 this morning. Matthew 7. I'm going to begin where we started last week, which was verse 1. But our main text for this morning is verse 6. So we're just going to get a little run at it for context's sake. And really, I'm going to read through to verse verse 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Pearls before swine. Right, Father, thank you again for your word. And uh, for each one who's here, member and visitor and regular tender, Lord, I'm just thankful for this church and this church family and uh, for the uh, truth that we are able to lift up here, Lord. You say that the church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And we pray that we would fulfill that purpose here this morning by uplifting the truth upon which we are based. Lord, we thank you for for what you're going to do in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was around six or seven, our family got a dog. It was so exciting. We got a German short-haired pointer that we called uh, Danny. And I remember for... At first, he was kind of an indoor dog, and once we moved out to the farm, he was, he was out in the garage. He was fine, you know. And, but uh, even when he was an indoor dog, he was not allowed in the kitchen. So there was this metal transition piece between the carpet and the vinyl in the kitchen, you know, and that was his line. And he had been trained, that's your line. So, of course, he's right up against it every time, you know, when we're in the dining room having having our meal, his paws would be on that transition piece. I mean, he's just, he's right there, you know, his nose about as far into the kitchen as he, as he dared go, giving us pathetic little looks as, as we would eat our, our supper. And he would always rather have what we were eating than the dry dog food that he had. And if he waited long enough, patient enough, without whining, he would sometimes get some scraps. You know, he'd get the, the bone from the pork chop or from the steak or whatever we were having. He'd get a couple of scraps. I'm telling you, he lived for the scraps, Danny did. He loved it. I remember one time there was something delicious, you know, sitting out on the kitchen counter. And uh, Dad wasn't quite home from work yet, so it wasn't quite dinner time. And Dan, Dad was the one that Danny feared the most. He had done all the training and stuff. And uh, my mom could yell at him, and he'd just look at her, you know, and wag his tail. And we would try to be the bosses, but we're the kids, and so he didn't listen to us. But when Dad spoke, Danny cowered. I mean, he was, he was very, very obedient to Dad. But Dad wasn't there. And there's something delicious wafting in, you know. And uh, so in a moment of weakness, Danny caved in, and he, he crossed the threshold. And he darted into the kitchen, and he snagged it that food right off of the counter that was for supper. And he chowed down. But by the time Dad got home, strangely, Danny could not be found. He was uh, hiding in a corner somewhere, knew that he had done wrong, knew he was going to be in trouble and pay for that. It's one thing for the dog to get the scraps, you know, to get the bone after the family has already eaten. 
But I'm telling you, my mom didn't slave away all day cooking pork chops for the dog. That was, that was for us. It wasn't for him. He might have enjoyed it, but you know, Danny enjoyed a lot of things. He, he would enjoy a dry biscuit that you give to him, a dog biscuit. He would in, sometimes enjoy a fly out of the window. Uh, he would enjoy grass. He would, for some reason, enjoy his own vomit once in a while. So uh, he doesn't need the best from our table. Scraps are plenty for a dog. Uh, it's, it, it's not for him. Well, imagine a uh, picture here before us. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. The picture is of, say, a family in Israel. They have brought, they have raised up a sheep that is without blemish. It's for a sacrifice for their family. And they bring it to the door of the tabernacle and they slay that sheep. And the priest inspects it outside and inside, make sure that there are no, no diseases or no boils or no blemishes at all in it. And, and he dedicates that to God. Parts of it go onto the altar. The other parts are set apart and they are holy uh, and supposed to be eaten only by the priests and, and very holy. Now imagine if somebody took that meat that had been offered on the altar of God and it was holy and it was set apart for the priests and for a certain purpose and they took that and they threw it outside the walls of the tabernacle to a pack of dogs out there and they started chewing it up and eating. It was supposed to be special, right? It was supposed to be, it was supposed to be something that was holy. That would be inappropriate to waste it on those unclean dogs that couldn't care less what it is. You know, dogs weren't uh, highly regarded in Israeli culture as they are in ours. The, to, here in America, I mean, a dog is man's best friend, you know. You, you, and somebody said, you can, you can tell who loves you most. You know, who loves you most, your wife or your dog? And here's how you tell. Put the meats in the trunk of a car for a day. And whichever one's happiest to see you loves you the most. <laughs> I think the dog would love you still. Dogs are man's best friend, you know. And, uh, but in Israel, they were unclean. They were an unclean animal. They were not kept as pets like that. Uh, dogs that were around were more like uh, half wild dogs. They'd roam the streets, you know, in packs. And sometimes they'd hunt the little animals. But mostly they were just nasty scavengers. They'd be tearing into garbage. They'd eat whatever dead things that they found. Uh, they, they, you, don't, you don't waste that which is good and that which is holy on dogs that don't care what they put in their mouth. They don't care what is holy. That's the first little picture that Jesus gives. And, but then he emphasizes it in a second way. Kind of the same truth, but in another way. He says in verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend at you. So here you've got a picture of a bunch of hogs and they're rutting around in the mud. We all know what cleanly animal pigs are. Animals, pigs are, get my pronouns straight here. And, uh, you know, the, the pigs, they are happy to eat whatever they can find. They'll eat corn, but they'll eat bugs, and they'll eat slop, and they'll eat, they'll eat pork scraps, not even aware they're eating their own kind, you know. They were the unclean of the unclean in Israel. The, the Jews didn't even raise them on their farms because they couldn't sacrifice them and they couldn't eat them. So they had no, no use for swine. So imagine somebody taking precious jewels, a necklace of pearls maybe, and instead of giving it to your daughter, who could wear it beautifully, you know, and could showcase and it would beautify her and, and just add to the beauty that was there, you, you take those pearls and you throw them out in the swine pen. Well, probably they're going to try to eat them first, and then when they figure out they can't eat them, they're just going to trample them down and then they're going to come back to you for more food. Perhaps violently. You ever heard people say, don't feed the bears? If you go out to Yellowstone or something like that, there's always these stories of dumb people, you know. Um, there's a grizzly bear. Let's, let's get it over here. You know, let's feed it. Now, once you run out of food, you become the food. Now, that's the problem. And that's kind of the same idea with these swine of the bigger, wilder sort, you know, big wild hogs. You don't mess with them. And, and you certainly don't, don't feed them something that's just going to make them mad. They're going to come back and they're going to rend you. He says, it's not safe, not smart. What, a, what an interesting pair of illustrations he gives us, you know, something to really chew on here this morning. Because Jesus has this way of making practical points with 
almost ridiculous, ridiculously extreme illustrations. Like we just talked about the moat and the beam. Maybe you've gotten a splinter in your eye, but I guarantee you've not had a log in your eye. Okay? But he, that's the picture he presents. So he takes it to the extreme to really give us a truth. And, uh, you know, I mean, who would give some special, holy, set-apart morsel to dogs? Nobody would do that. Who would, who would really take fine jewelry and give it to, to pigs? Nobody would do that. But he's making a point here. It's an illustration of a spiritual truth. This might surprise you, but the dogs and the swine that Jesus is talking about are actually certain kinds of people that we need to identify by exercising wisdom and discernment. So that which is holy, the pearls, that's regarding that which we deal with in, as disciples. You know, we deal with spiritual things. They have treasures in heaven. We're supposed to have our focus on not on material things on the earth where rust and moth doth, doth corrupt and so on. And we're supposed to have our eyes upon that which is eternal, that which is spiritual. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That means it's not material. His kingdom is not a material kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom. It's a kingdom of righteousness. It's a kingdom of peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual kingdom. Look at Matthew uh, 13, Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So he's talking about the kingdom of heaven here, the pearl, the things that are precious, the things of God, the matters of the kingdom. So the point is that the things of the God are more, of more value than anything that we can accumulate here on the earth. So we've been given the word of God. We've been given the gospel. Amen. Aren't you thankful? We talked about the gospels in Sunday school and how, man, you remove those four books out of the Bible, you don't have a Bible anymore. There's, nothing, there's no Christianity. There's no point to the whole Old Testament. There's no point to the rest of the New Testament. If what happened there on the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection didn't take place. The gospel has been entrusted to us. We have been given the responsibility to uphold and declare the truth. And so these things of, of truth and salvation and the kingdom of heaven, those are our pearls, aren't they? This is what's supposed to be precious to us. Are you with me this morning? Okay. Yeah. We need to just pass out espressos to everybody. here. No. <laughs> All right. So what is precious, supposed to be precious to us as disciples? Spiritual things. Things about the kingdom. Truth. Bible. Salvation. Gospel. These are our holy things. These are our precious pearls. And Jesus says that we are not supposed to waste these on those who are dogs or swine. Like, whoa. What's that? What's that all about? You know, well, really, it depends on who he has in mind here. In some places in the Bible, uh, it's the Gentiles that are referred to as dogs because they're unclean compared to the flock of his sheep. Look at Matthew 15. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts. So if she came out of Canaan, is she an Israelite? That's a no. All right? Pop quiz. Fail. All of you fail. fail, fail. No. If she's out of Canaan, she's a Canaanite, not an Israelite. She's a Gentile, not a Jew. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her, Not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat, it's not fitting, to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Whoa. See what he just said there to her? That the children of Israel are, those are the children. And the Gentiles outside of that flock, 
are the dogs. It's not meat to cast the children's bread to dogs. But look at her response here. <clears throat> Verse 27, and she said, truth, Lord. <laughs> what humility. Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So it's, it's kind of shocking, isn't it, that Jesus would say that, that he would almost call her a dog, that, that you're, you're unclean. You are not of Israel. But her response is equally surprising. If, this, if somebody called you that, your response would be, well, fine then. Fine. I'll get help somewhere else. You know, insulted. But she bows down. And she says, true. Your, your assessment of me as unclean is a true one, Lord. All I'm asking for is some crumbs. And really, this was a test, wasn't it? I, I read this week about a United Methodist bishop that said that Jesus was he, he was a bigot, and he was racist and prejudiced, and he had to get over that. He had to learn to get over it. And it's like, what are you talking about? This is a test of this woman's faith. So when Jesus says, cast not your pearls before swine, give not holy things to the dogs, I don't think he's talking about Gentiles, because what did he do? He went ahead and helped her, didn't he? He went ahead and served her. See, Jesus wasn't referring to Gentiles there, and if he was... That'd be bad news for you and me. If you're not a Jew, that would be bad news. The gospel has been spread to us. He cares about all people from the very beginning. Jesus was never racist. Jesus was never bigoted. The, the human race has always been included entirely in his plan of redemption. And so it's not about the Gentiles, but neither is it about just unbelievers. Because Jesus went to the lost. He tells his disciples, I want you to take this, the gospel, and I want you to preach it to every creature, to the uttermost. So it can't just be the lost because they're unclean and stuff, that they're all dogs and swine, and, and we've got the truth here in our church, and, and we're not going to go and take it to all of them because they're unworthy. If they, if they were worthy, they'd come here and they'd, they'd get it. No, 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 no. Jesus said, go. You go and preach to them. You, you preach to every creature. So what is he talking about? What, what is this about? If it's not about the Gentiles, it's not about the, the lost at large. See, it's not about who the person is. It really doesn't have to do with their religion or their ethnicity or whether they're a Jew or a Gentile or lost. I believe the difference is this. It's about how they respond to the truth when they hear it. How they respond to the truth when they hear it. Turn with me to John 10. I'm going to show you this. John 10. Verse 14. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? <laughs> He's your shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And know my sheep. And am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep have I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Verse 19, kind of revealing. Here it says, there was a division therefore, again among the Jews, for these sayings. And many of them said, he hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? So there's, Jesus is preaching. Jesus is doing miracles. Jesus is doing all this stuff, talking about being the good shepherd. And there's this segment that says he's out of his mind. He's possessed with the devil. Why do you listen to him? And you've got other people that are hearing and seeing the same things, saying, no, no, no. This is a man of God here. There's something special about him. Which one do you think would qualify as more like dogs and swine? The people that rejected the truth once they had heard it. The ones that fought against it. 
the ones that accused him of being possessed by a devil. They, they, they saw the miracles. They heard his words. Some of them believed and followed him. Others saw all the same stuff, but turned like swine to rend him. Look at verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So Jesus made it clear there are other sheep out there, right? Other sheep I have, uh, verse 16, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. There are other sheep out there that are not yet a part of his fold, and he wants to reach them. But the way to tell the difference between a sheep and a dog, between sheep and swine, is how people respond to his word. Those who are sheep hear his voice and follow him. Isn't that what he said? That's exactly what he said. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's verse 25, uh, and Jesus answered them, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Those who are sheep hear the truth and they acknowledge it as truth and they follow Jesus. Those who are dogs and swine reject the truth, actively reject it, and even fight against it. Now, I don't believe that this is a predestination sort of thing. I don't think God created us and said, okay, you're going to be sheep and you're going to be a dog. You know, I... No, we choose our own responses. We're accountable for our own decisions. We make the choice when we are confronted with the truth, whether we will accept that truth or reject it and fight against it. We choose what category that we are in. They've said that the greatest uh, commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So let's look at a commentary on this in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. My hope this morning is that this maybe obscure little verse is getting clearer as we go. And that by the end you'll understand really what it means for us and the implications of it. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 20. He says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world. Now, that's not talking about plastic and carbon dioxide. (laughs) The pollutions of the world, you understand what that is? The sin that has enslaved everyone. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It's a picture of someone who, they're in bondage to sin, they hear the gospel of Christ, and they recognize, that could set me free. That is is the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is your escape patch. And they see how it offers cleansing and victory and salvation from sin, but he says, but they turn from that free gift And they go back to become entangled again in the pollution of the world. That it's worse for them after that. Verse 21, for it had been better for them to have not, that for it would, let me try again, I get it. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. That's just saying that there's lesser punishment for those who have never heard the truth, who never had the opportunity to receive the gospel. There's going to be degrees of punishment in hell. Listen, unless a person turns from their sin and trusts in Jesus Christ as the only means of salvation, they cannot be saved. They cannot go to heaven. It's not like God's going to say, well, you didn't have a chance really, so I'll let you in. No, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. And it's on us to make sure they have a chance. Amen? But those who have never heard, there will be a lesser degree of punishment and accountability than those who have heard the gospel over and over and over and over. He said, no, not for me. No, they knew. 
and they willfully turned again, away from it. And, and now, now they're accountable for what they know. Uh, th- there is a responsibility that comes with light and truth and knowledge, and it's very dangerous, actually, for somebody to hear the gospel and for the Holy Spirit to give them understanding of it and conviction in their hearts, and they know what they're supposed to do, but they close that door and they reject God's offer of salvation. God looks down on that person and says, listen, you knew what you needed to do. You knew that you were a sinner. You knew you were supposed to be saved, and you did nothing about it. He said, I'm telling you, it's going to be better for those who never even had that kind of knowledge and accountability. If you're aware of the gospel, you're accountable to respond to the gospel. It's not that they may never be saved in the future, but again, they're accountable. And the thing is, once you start saying no to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that conviction gets fainter and fainter. You keep saying no, you keep, uh, it, it, like it, the Bible says it sears the conscience. It's like it puts a, 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 a hard shell around the heart, and, and it, it, the, the, the knocking of the Holy Spirit, the conviction, it gets less and less with each rejection until the time comes when there's no more conviction felt. People can hear the gospel, they can sit in a preaching service, and they just sit there and they're like, okay, I'm good. And it just doesn't touch them anymore. That's a scary place to be. But the point is that God respects our free will. And if we keep saying, no, I'm not interested. No, I'm not interested. Eventually God says, okay. Okay. I'm not going to speak to you anymore about it. You've made your decision. And God gives them over to a reprobate mind and lets them have their way. When somebody hears the truth, and in pride and stubbornness, they reject that truth, they are revealed to be the dogs and swine that they are. Preacher, that is harsh. Who came up with those terms? Not me. <laughs> Jesus. Take it up with Jesus. He said so. And Peter says the same thing here. Look at verse 22. But it, it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. They don't appreciate what's holy. They don't want the pearls. They don't want to become a part of the flock because they're not sheep. They are, in the words of Jesus, dogs and swine. So what's the point of all this? Now that we've kind of identified everything the Lord's talking about, what is he actually saying? Turn back to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. In verses 1 through 5, we read it last time we talked about it. Judge not, that ye be not judged. And, and uh, if you see somebody with a fault in their life, a moat in their eye, he says, don't go trying to help them until you first will examine yourself in the light of Scripture. And, and, and God gave us his word so that we could look to it, allow him to change us. And that's a good tip, by the way. If you're sitting in church and your mind is always running to, ooh, I hope this person heard that. I hope they heard that. You're missing what God wants you to hear. Be careful that God is able to change you. Quit looking around for the moats and start start realizing the beams in the eyes. But then, once God has illuminated your heart, once he has changed you, you've allowed him to change you, then we are able to help others. We're able to encourage them. We're able to edify them and say, hey, brother, I see this as a possible red flag in your life. I I see this as a danger. I I, I, I sense that you're getting on a path of sin here, and that sin's going to lead to destruction. I want to encourage you. And we are to help other people in those ways. But here's a fact. You can only help someone who wants to be helped. Ever found that to be true? You can only help someone who wants to be helped. If a man goes overboard off of a ship, but uh, he thinks he's just having fun, you can throw him the life preserver, But if he doesn't grab on, there's not much you can do. You can only help someone who wants to be helped. I I dealt with the police one time regarding a homeless man who was in the alleyway, and it was cold out, and I didn't didn't want to read in the paper that he froze to death or something, you know? And so I contacted the police, and they helped him out, you know, and stuff. And and I, I talked to the officer, and I said, what can we do as a church? I didn't call just so I could get this guy in trouble. That's not our goal, you know? But... 
how do we help people like that? And he said the exact same words. He said, you can only help people that want to be helped. And he said, we know this guy. He has a house. He has a family. He's got a Facebook account. He's chosen this way of life. He wants to drink into all hours of the night and stumble around the streets till he passes out. This is his choice. You can give somebody a job. You can give them a, a new life. You can give them all that they need. But if they don't want it, you're not going to help them. You can't help them. You can give a pig some pearls and wash it up real pretty, put a bow on it. But the next time it sees mud, it's going back to the mud hole. It's going gonna, it's gonna to trample on the pearls because you haven't changed its nature. You've only changed it on the outside. It's going to go back. See, the Lord, I believe what he's talking about in this section of Scripture is being wise about our use of time and energy. Because we're his disciples, we're his ambassadors. And, and in the first part of the, the chapter there, he's saying, don't waste your time and energy being critical, being judging of people. Because you've got stuff you can work on right now, and there are people out there that need your help. And so quit criticizing, quit nitpicking, quit judging everybody, and just help people with the word of God. But then he kind of shifts it over and says, you know what? You can only help the people that want to be helped. So don't waste your time and energy trying to help those who don't want to be helped. That's sad, but it's a true statement. Look at Matthew chapter 10. In, that, in, in Matthew chapter 10, the Lord is sending out the, his 12 apostles into the towns and villages of Israel, and they're supposed to be preaching about the kingdom of heaven and all of this. In other words, they're bringing them pearls, aren't they? They're bringing them that which is holy. They're taking them the gospel. Verse 11, And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire in it who is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if, you, if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. For verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why don't you go everywhere proclaiming the truth? I want you to give everybody a chance to hear the message of the kingdom. But if people reject your message, I don't expect you to stay put there forever. He says, when you depart, when you decide it's time to go. The, the, I mean, there's other sheep out there. There's, there's other sheep in other cities that want to hear it, that would gladly receive the truth. So there comes a time when the disciples had to make a judgment call and know when it's time to shake the dust off of their feet and try to go reach somebody who will actually receive it. The, the teaching of the Lord should affect us as well. Maybe in the way we do our outreach and go be witnesses. You know, sometimes we'll go door to door like that, and sometimes in other ways. But let's just say, for instance, you're out door knocking and you're trying to invite people to church. And you've got an invitation or whatever, but uh, before you can even... Really talk to them. They chew you out. They slam that door in your face, you know, and they want nothing to do with you. And, and they're yelling and whatever. Listen, that's not code for try harder. <laughs> that's not what they're saying. You, you've done your job at that point. You've tried to give them the gospel. You've tried to witness to them. We've tried. And at that point, it's time to move to the next door and just kind of commit those people to God. Sometimes I'll get into a conversation with someone and they'll talk, but really, they, you can tell very quickly, they just want to argue. They want to debate. They want to show off how much that they know. You know, They're trying to stump you. They're not interested in receiving Christ, you understand? They're interested in showing off how much they know. They don't really want to hear what you have to say. They want you to hear what they have to say. They just want to win an argument. At some point, it becomes obvious the conversation's going nowhere, and it's time to just kind of wrap it up because there are other people down the street who might actually want to hear it, who might want to receive the gospel. And it doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense as stewards to waste further time and energy 
tr on somebody who has no intention of hearing or accepting the truth of the gospel. Maybe this has happened in your family. Maybe you got up the courage one time to try to witness, you know, to that relative and to share your testimony with them, and they look at you with the crossest eyes you've ever seen, and they say, stop it. I don't want to hear any more about this stuff. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Because you love them. You want them to get saved. You want them to do right. You, you, and, and you just know they're lost and need to trust Christ, but there's this wall up now, and they're not going to listen to you anymore when you try to witness to them. They shut you down every time it comes up. What are we supposed to do in such situations like this? Well, I think Jesus is teaching us. You stop casting your pearls before swine who don't want to hear it before they turn and rend us and the relationship is damaged beyond repair. Well, does that mean they can't be saved? Well, no. No, not necessarily. But God is going to have to work in other ways to bring that person to a place of repentance. So your job then is just to be light in your life. You've, you've done your best. You've tried to verbalize it. You've tried to give them truth. They rejected it. So now you show them truth instead of telling them. You show them every day with a life that is consistent, with a testimony that is real and Christ-honoring. Well, does that mean that we give up on them? Well, well, no. No, of course not. We don't give up on them. Turn back to Matthew 7. It's no coincidence that as soon as the Lord has finished instructing about these things that are unproductive uses of our time, the very next thing he says is about taking things to God in prayer. Notice that? Verse 7, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. If you, have, if, if you have to stop casting the pearls and stop actively verbally witnessing to that loved one, you enter into verse 7 where you commit it to God and you keep asking and you keep seeking and you keep knocking and you don't give up on them. You just Switch tactics so that you don't ruin the relationship. You keep the door open to be able to be a witness to them. My grandma, Carol Hoyseth, was the first saved in our family. Uh, my grandpa, Bobby, was not saved at the time. And to be honest, he was not interested at all in her newfound faith and this new direction she was going. He would let her go to church and do her thing, but he was not coming along on that journey. And he let it be known. That was not for him. He was adamant about it. So my grandmother continued to go to church, continued to grow in the Lord, continued to serve as she could. She became a Sunday school teacher. She taught in the Christian school. She picked up all of us grandkids every Sunday for years uh, and brought us to Sunday school. And every Wednesday night when the prayer requests would be taken, I'm talking about every Wednesday night, every week, pray for Bobby. Pray be saved. They eventually went to a written, written request. And like ours, we do it every month. They do it every week. And so it starts from scratch. If you want something that you really want to pray about, you've got to keep it on there yourself every week. Bob's salvation. Every week. Never stop. I'm talking years. I'm talking decades. There came a time in their marriage where she couldn't say much about it. She couldn't just keep preaching at him. She couldn't nag him about it. She had to give it to God, and then she kept living out the truth of the gospel, and her life, her changed life, became the most powerful sermon that our family had ever seen or heard. Just her life. And she never gave up. And then one day, some decades later, my grandpa Bobby came to church. And the pastor preached a sermon that day about the demon-possessed maniac of Gadara who had a legion of devils in him a man who was out of control, out of his right mind. And he heard that day about how Jesus cast the devils into the swine who ran off a cliff and drowned in the sea and how God changed this man who nobody else could change into a man that was back in control of his life, who was sitting, who was clothed and in his right mind. And my stubborn grandpa, one of the toughest men I've ever known, came running down the altar, tears. This man never cried. Tears coming down his face, 
And God took this gospel-rejecting, wicked man and turned him into a sheep. (laughs) My grandpa today, if you know him, he's one of the kindest, gentlest men you'll ever meet. He's submissive and supportive to his pastor. He's a servant in the church. His life is totally different from what it used to be. Only God. Only God can make that kind of change. And so, no, we never give up on people. (laughs) We never stop praying. We never stop loving. But listen, there are times when we've just got to stop hounding people about what we've already told them, what they already know, and let the Holy Spirit do the work. So be discerning in, our, in your witnessing efforts. If, if you can help it, don't ruin a relationship. You know, sometimes you have no control over it, and it happens. You know, Jesus said, expect that. But there may be times when you follow Jesus that you have to leave father or mother or sister or brother. Sometimes that's going to happen. We need to at least make sure they know the truth. But at that point, their response is between them and God. All we can do is be faithful. right? We live the life God has called us to live. We spend our lives helping those who want our help. When people come to the church, I, I would love for everybody who ever walked through the doors to keep coming. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be great? We, we would already be in a different building by now if that were the case, you know. I, I would desire that. I want that. And so when people come, I usually follow up with them. I reach out. I text. I, I try to visit, you know, and, and connect. But, so, but you know what? Ultimately, if, if somebody doesn't want to come, what good does that do? I can't go chasing people, everybody down and every single week and say, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. If they want it, they want it. If people want to come, they'll come, won't they? If people want to get saved, they'll get saved. Our job is to tell them, to tell them the truth. Before we're done, let me ask you this. What have you done with Jesus? If you've been here, you know the truth. You know that the Bible teaches that every single one of us was born in sin. Amen? I think I'm talking to people that understand that. I don't think I have to belabor and prove to you that you are a sinner in the sight of God. If you have never accepted Christ's sacrifice on the cross, then you are still lost in sin, and you are on your way to hell. And I tell you that with all the love in my heart. But God loves you. Gave His only begotten Son to save you. Are you ready yet to turn from what you have been and follow Christ? Are you ready to be a sheep? Or will you continue to stubbornly reject and ignore this offer of grace? Listen, God did not design for you to be some dog or some pig that tramples on the things of God. But when you hear the truth of the gospel and you repeatedly say no, that's exactly what you're doing. You're taking the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the holiest offering that has ever been made, and you're wasting it. You're taking the precious pearls of the gospel of eternal life, and you're stamping it in the mud. You have no appreciation for it. That is not God's intention for your life. He made you to be a sheep. He said, I, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Go get them. <laughs> he wants you to be a part of his family. He wants you to be a part of his flock. And you know what? It, but we choose our own response, don't we? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. Aren't you sick of fighting it? Aren't you sick of fighting against the Holy Spirit? And being prideful about it? Are are you ready yet to just surrender to God? You know you're supposed to. You know you should. And for whatever reason, you just keep resisting that or you think it's not a big deal. I'm telling you, it's time. Quit wasting what God has put in front of you. Because I'm telling you, there's nothing else like being found by the Good Shepherd. Nothing like it. 
And if you're still lost, it's not because he doesn't know where you are. It's because you've made it clear you don't want to be found. If you're ready to take your place under the care of the good shepherd, to cease from living your life and instead follow him, why not make that decision right now, today? And you can go from being lost to saved, from being a dog to being a sheep. That's why he made each each and every one of us. Hope you hear the message this morning. Father, thank you for the truth of your word and Oh, harsh words from Jesus, but such truth in them. And he could speak the hard words because he was willing to do the hard things to prove his love. He said everything he said was from a heart of love. And Lord, may that be us as well. Give us wisdom with our family members, Lord. When there's been a wall put up and they've made it abundantly clear, Lord, just give us wisdom. (coughs) what to say and how to say it and how to live in such a way that we, our light shines before men that they may glorify our Father. Lord, there's people out there that want to hear. Help us find them. Help us spend our time and our energy and our resources looking for those who are searching for God. Father, if there's somebody here today who's not saved, God, I pray this day would not be like all the other times that they have heard it and walked away unchanged. But that this would be a decision point in their lives where they say, no longer, I'm not walking out those doors again lost. And today would be the day they would trust in you for salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody with your heads bowed, eyes closed. I have no doubt in my mind, just the Lord just been working this morning. He's working in you. And that requires a response. Haven't we talked about that? We choose our responses. You've been confronted by truth. What are you going to do with it this morning? As the pianist plays, I want you to do something with what you've heard. I want you to respond. Take care of business with God. If you want to come down here and say, Pastor, I, I'm not safe. I, I know it. Hey, we're, I'm going to, we're going to go find a place in this building. and We're going to open up the Bible And I'm going to show you what God says about it. So you can make a decision on your own. Maybe you're burdened about that loved one, that neighbor, that friend. You've tried to witness to, but the wall's gone up. Ask, and you shall find. Seek, knock, keep on knocking. Bring them before the Lord in prayer.
thank you for the message from your word. We thank you for the response here this morning. And Lord, I pray that uh, the work that you have begun in us today will not cease here with the closing of the service. That you'll continue to work, continue to use it, continue to help us be better Christians than we were before. Lord, we ask that you dismiss us now in your care. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, tonight we're back in the book of Hebrews. Let me.